questions, Question Oral, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Canadians woke up this morning and were shocked to learn they have a new NDP Liberal government that is planning to spend and tax unlike anything we've seen before. Now things are starting to make sense. Now we understand why the NDP have been so eager to prop up the Liberals and their unethical behaviour. It's because they have been cooking up a secret backroom deal. My question to the leader of the new NDP Liberal Party yeah. is this. When did he start these secret talks with his new Deputy Prime Minister, the member for Burnaby South? Was it before, during, or just after the last election? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. What this agreement means is in this time of uncertainty and pressures on Canadians, we're going to have predictability and an ability to focus on delivering the things that Canadians asked us all for collectively in the last election. Uh, more investments in housing, uh, better support for families, help with the cost of living, growth for Canadians, the fight against climate change increased, uh, and support on reconciliation. The toxicity and polarization that we'd seen in Parliament of the past uh, is now an opportunity for us to deliver for Canadians, and that's what we shall do. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Canadians are already suffering because of massive inflation, which is caused by the out-of-control spending of the old Liberal government. Now, Canadians are going to be living with a new NDP Liberal government, and the price tag has just skyrocketed. The NDP Liberal government's initial platform will cost over $200 billion, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Can the NDP Liberal Prime Minister tell Canadians how much this backroom deal is going to cost them? How much? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we made a commitment in the last election to invest in housing, to invest in support for families, to invest in childcare, to grow the economy, to fight the pandemic, to move forward on fighting climate change. These are all things that we continue to be focused on. And Mr. Speaker, what we're going to see is an ability to work across party lines to reduce the toxic partisanship that we've seen in the past in this House and actually move forward on delivering concrete for Canadians. That's what Canadians want. That's what we're going to deliver. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, we've seen an attack from the left on Canada's oil and gas sector, our agricultural sector and fisheries all huge job creators. And now that extreme left-wing wing agenda has been baked into this secret backroom deal. Mm. The NDP Liberal platform will double down and intensify the attack on Canadian natural resources and jobs. So Canadians deserve to know how many more jobs are going to be lost, specifically in our natural resources, because of the NDP Liberal government and their backroom deal. Here, here, here. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians saw what aggressive partisanship and toxicity in this place uh, led to in terms of uh, uh, a slowed down agenda delivering for Canadians. What we've been able to do uh, in moving forward during this pandemic, seeing Canadians come together, uh, is actually what we're going to be able to continue to do moving forward. Deliver on the things uh, that we stood up for uh, in the last election. Deliver for Canadians and the things that they need to grow the economy, create good jobs for everyone, uh, while fully continuing to respect Parliament. <laughs> I'm going to take a moment here and just to remind folks that uh, there's been a great uh, uh, listening of the, of the questions and I'm hoping there's going to be a good listening of the answers so that we can uh, make, sure, make sure that we understand where everybody stands in this, this, this issue. But I'm hearing, I'm hearing lots, of, lots, of, uh, lots of shots coming over here, so I want to be, be sure that we actually hear the answers that the Prime Minister is trying to give us. The Honourable, the official leader of the, the, of the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, make no mistake, Mr. Speaker, this backroom deal disrespects Parliament and it disrespects every single Canadian voter. Yeah, right. 
Gas prices right now are shockingly high and they're going up, unfairly punishing Canadians and families. But today, Conservatives have proposed a reasonable and positive solution to save Canadians' money at the gas pump. Conservatives are consistently conservative and we always want to lower taxes for all Canadians. Will the NDP Liberal government tell this House if they support our motion or will their first act as a coalition government be to continuing punishing Canadians with high taxes at the gas pumps? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The uh, leader of the official opposition needs to be careful when she's talking about supporting democracy, not spreading misinformation and disinformation at the same time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Canadians returned this parliament in a minority situation in the last election because they expected parties to work together collaboratively to deliver for Canadians. That is exactly what we're doing as we reach out across party lines to work together on the things where we agree and there will be plenty of room for robust, informed debate in the areas we disagree. That's how Parliament should work, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to stand up for democracy. The Honourable Member for Megantic-Lérable. Mr. Speaker, I'm not quite sure who to ask my question to today. The new NDP Liberal government uh, didn't have a leadership race, but it's clear that the government's new political agenda is largely inspired by the NDP's last federal campaign. More spending, more tax, more intrusion into provincial jurisdiction, and less and less respect for Parliament. Maybe the Prime Minister can help us. Maybe he'll make room for the leader of the NDP and formally appoint him Deputy Prime Minister to replace the current Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, this is an opportunity for us to work together collaboratively on issues that we agree on. And to continue to disagree on other issues where we disagree. But this will allow us, this will, rather this will allow this House to operate more constructively and to deliver for Canadians on the pri priorities that we all share in this House. Whether that's economic growth, help for the most vulnerable, fighting climate change, economic growth. These are Canadians' priorities and we're going to work constructively on them. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now that the NDP and the Liberals have uh, taken their honeymoon together, maybe they could come over here and all of the Liberals could uh, get on uh, that side and they can form their own house together. Now, the basis of this agreement is basically intruding into provincial jurisdiction. Pharmacare, dental care, health care. So, is it not really the goal of this agreement that this newlywed uh, government will actually trample all over Quebec jurisdiction? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, in the last election, we had this debate. This government, this Liberal government, has always underlined that we profoundly believe that the federal government needs to ensure that the quality of health care provided across this country is as good as possible and is consistent for all Canadians. We will always work collaboratively and with respect for the provinces. But we will also ensure that all Canadians across the country get high quality health care. That's what people expect. The Honourable Member for Belay Chambly. Mr. Speaker, the NDP is very hostile to Quebec's Bill 21, the secularism law. Now, a candidate uh, for the Conservative Party is even hostile toward this bill. Now, in this new alliance, is there not also an attempt to take the resources and money of the Canadian state to attack Quebec's Bill 21. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians across this country expect the federal government to be there to defend the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and to defend the fundamental rights of all Canadians. That's what we will always do. We will always be there to ensure that every individual's rights are respected. Well, member for Burnaby South. Oh. 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 Oh.
stores while families are struggling to put food on the table and fill up their tanks. We know that these companies have made record profits. We've got a chance to do something about that later on today when we can vote to tax our excess profits and reinvest that into people. Order, order. I know, I know the temptation is there. I understand. <laughs> Okay, can we just can we just keep it so we can actually hear the question uh, that the member is asking? The honourable member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oil and gas companies and big box stores have made record profits, while everyday families are struggling to buy their groceries and to fill up their tanks. We've got an opportunity to do something about that today when we vote on our Opposition Day motion, our plan to tax the excess profits of these corporations and reinvest that into helping people. We already know that the Conservatives are going to support the profits of big oil and gas. Where will the Prime Minister stand? With people and families or with the large corporations who have made excess profits? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. From the very beginning of our time in office in 2015, we've moved forward on lowering taxes for the middle class and raising them. All right, this is the last time that I'm standing on this one. Okay. <laughs> because, you know, quite honestly, I'm getting tired of standing on this one. Uh, listen, let's just try to keep a little decorum in the House. I know there's a lot of energy to be let out. I know we're still happy to be here after a, a few week break. Uh, but it's good to be here, to talk to folks, to understand what's going on. Uh, and I believe the Honourable Prime Minister was trying to answer the question, or where were we? Because I kind of lost track. <laughs> Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when we got elected in 2015, it was uh, on a commitment to lower taxes for the middle class and raise them on the wealthiest 1%. We did that. And then we moved forward with more supports for seniors, more supports for families. Uh, we've continued uh, to look at ways of enabling economic growth and support for small businesses, while at the same time making sure that the tax system is fair. Mr. Speaker, uh, these bells ringing are not uh, ideal for me. Listen, I'm going to stand here as long as it takes. Thank you. Thank you. I, pre I, pre I appreciate it over there. We don't need to be ringing bells. We don't need to be yelling and screaming. Let's, it, it, let's, just, make sure, let's just make sure we get through question period before 5 o'clock tonight. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oil and gas companies and big box stores made record profits. Well, Canadian families are having a hard time buying their groceries or filling up their, their gas tank. We have an opportunity to fix this problem today by taxing the excess profits of big oil and gas companies and reinvesting that money into helping families. Will the Prime Minister protect the interests of ordinary people or the profits of big companies? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since we were elected in 2015, we've always been focused on helping the middle class. We increased the taxes on the wealthiest Canadians in order to reduce them on middle class Canadians. We created the Canada Child Benefit, which lifted hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty. And we're continuing to invest in daycare centres, in seniors, and we will always be there to support people. We will always be there to support Canadians through these periods of uncertainty. The agreement that we have made will allow this Parliament to operate better with less toxicity, as sometimes we've continued to see from the Conservatives. Or Abbotsford. Maybe, if we are speaking, yeah. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the new NDP Liberal Coalition. In its last election platform, the NDP promised over $214 billion of spending, with no plan to ever balance the budget. Now, the NDP and the Liberals have secretly negotiated a deal to circumvent our democracy and go on a massive spending spree that future generations are going to have to pay back. How many billions has this Prime Minister bargained away in order to hang on to power, and how many of the NDP's spending promises will we see in the Coalition's upcoming budget? The Honourable Minister. Oh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it was in fact the Conservatives who had in their platform uh, more spending than we did. Uh, but I think what's difficult watching uh, some of the reactions on the other side, Mr. Speaker, is just how irresponsible the positions they're taking are. Uh, we actually saw the leader of the official opposition say that somehow us working with other parliamentarians constituted supporting uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, I, I think that the opposition really should reflect upon the way they're working in this place and focus on collaboration. We're willing to work with anybody to get the agenda of the government done. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, as you know, the Parliamentary Budget Officer is responsible for evaluating the cost of various parties' election promises. That's what he did last fall for the NDP, notably. Do you know how much the NDP had committed to spend? $214 billion. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the current finance minister. I say current because you never know what will happen. But could the NDP Liberal Minister of Finance tell us how much her government will add to the debt in order to please their new friends at the NDP? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank my honorable colleague for his question. Let's take a minute to remember what our economic stewardship has meant for this country. GDP uh, has gone up. We recovered 112% of the jobs lost during the pandemic. S the S&P uh, restored our AAA rating. We are dealing with affordability, we're dealing with the economy, and we're here to move forward for this country. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, as we know, the NDP is a centralizing party. Well, it's not necessarily failing, but it's not what we think is best for Canada. So the new Liberal NDP government will be centralizing too, and that's going to lead to disputes with the provinces, which we certainly don't need. My question is for the government minister, not the minister for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Can they tell us which programs will be imposed on Quebec by the new coalition government? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I understand that my honorable, honorable colleague was talking about the Parliamentary Budget Officer in his last question. I think it's interesting to note that that same person, the PBO, said that the Conservative Party, in their platform in the last election, was going to spend more money than we will be investing in helping Canadians. I understand that our Conservatives Conservative friends are frustrated that the toxic atmosphere of Parliament is probably coming to an end, but we are here working to deliver for Canadians. That's what we're going to be doing in the coming years, and we're looking forward to working with all parties in this House. The Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, the NDP has always wavered on its stance with defence treaties like NATO and NORAD, even going so far as publishing a white paper where they made it clear that they would pull Canada out of NATO wow. at a time when Russia has attacked Ukraine. Our defence partnerships are now more important than ever. Does the new NDP Liberal government intend to uphold their promise to our allies, or will they pull out of NATO like the NDP so clearly wants to do. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. We are increasing our defence spending uh, by 70 per cent over the nine-year period beginning in 2017. We are very committed to our NATO and NORAD alliances, and we will continue to ensure that our Arctic is sovereign, that our continent is secure, and that we are ensuring upholding the rules-based international order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Foothills. The NDP Liberal government will continue to fail Canadian farmers, <laughs> lost markets, trade agreements, and they will continue to treat producers like a piggy bank with a farm-killing carbon tax that is devastating Canadian farmers. According to CFIB, Canadian farmers paid $14,000 a year in the first year of the carbon tax, $45,000 last year, wow. devastating Canadian farmers. This is no joke. On April Fool's Day, the carbon tax goes up yet again, and the NDP wants that tax to be even higher. So here's the question. On April 1st, just how much more are Canadian farmers going to have to pay for this new carbon tax coalition? Well the Honourable Minister of Agriculture. 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our farmers across the country are very aware of the importance of tackling climate change. The most important thing to them is their land. They're the first ones to be affected by climate extremes, like the droughts last summer or flooding. In order to help them, we've set up a number of programs, programs that will allow them to establish good practices, like uh, crop rotation. And we have programs to help them acquire new clean technology. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, energy self-sufficiency is national security, but the Liberals have killed four pipelines, more than 300,000 oil and gas jobs, more than $150 billion in energy and Indigenous projects, and lost 18 LNG export proposals. Now, a scheme with the NDP to end oil and gas in Canada and hike the carbon tax. Canada has the most responsible oil and gas and among the largest reserves in the world but still has to import. Does the Liberal NDP cabal really want to keep Canada having to rely on oil and gas from corrupt regimes and hostile despots? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. We need to lower emissions in Canada's oil and gas sector. And we are investing in a range of non-emitting technologies that will get us to net zero. There is great opportunity right across our country from these investments, including in Alberta and in Saskatchewan. We've seen solar farms and a growing industry in renewables. This is a good opportunity going forward for our country. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government has just experienced its own orange wave. Once again, the jurisdictions of Quebec and the provinces are being undermined. Housing, early childhood education, long-term care, health, pharmacare. This sounds like a provincial party's platform. And no matter how, how hard you look in the agreement, Mr. Speaker, you won't find the words right to opt out with full compensation. So has the Prime Minister decided, with the NDP's blessing, to strengthen his own power by trampling on Quebec and the provinces? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois just lives for these disputes. They can't understand that it's possible for parties to agree that something that's good for Quebecers and Canadians, uh, that's good for the fight against climate change, that's good for reconciliation, that's good for families, could be a good thing. If, if it's good, then the Bloc thinks it's bad. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Ah, uh, the famous rhetoric. In fact, what Quebecers are asking for is health transfers. Now we have this NDP Liberal Alliance, which is setting conditions on us, as if Ottawa knew better than us how to manage hospitals or understand Quebec's health care system. Everyone saw how poorly you managed your own matters of your own jurisdiction. And now the government's claiming that they understand provinces' needs in health, housing, or early childhood learning better than us. Why doesn't the NDP Liberal Alliance listen to Quebec and the provinces and increase the health transfers to 35 percent, no strings attached? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, we're listening to Quebec and the provinces. The people who aren't listening are the Bloc. They're always looking for disputes. They're always looking for jurisdictional disputes. But that doesn't create jobs, Mr. Speaker. That doesn't lead to hiring more doctors or nurses. Jurisdictional disputes are good for the Bloc, but they're not good for Quebecers or Canadians. We are delivering for Quebecers and for all Canadians. The Honourable Member from Montcalm. Well, when you don't have a valid argument, sometimes you just talk about disputes. Pharmacare, home care, long-term care, hiring doctors, none of this is federal jurisdiction. Let's face it, the NDP liberal deal isn't, it just, is just about strengthening uh, government. Its goal is to weaken the, the powers and choices of Quebec and the provinces, unless there is an opt-out provision. So with everything announced today, will the government and its little friends commit to giving Quebec and the provinces the right to opt out with full compensation without conditions. The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, since our government came to power, we've worked with the provinces on issues of great import importance, like health care, like how to protect Canadians during a pandemic, how to build and maintain investments in a public health care system that is the envy of the world. Those are exactly the types of constructive conversations that we've been having with all of the provinces, including Quebec. And we're looking forward to continuing those discussions. Hello. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. Mr. Speaker, the government is set to increase fuel prices on April 1st. This will drive inflation on already soaring food prices. And it's not only Canadian lives that Liberals are making harder. International students are already suffering due to the racism in IRCC and this Liberal-made immigration backlog. In the Metro Vancouver area, almost 70% of food bank users at the Gurunanik Food Bank are international students. Now, why is this NDP Liberal government so good and making so many people miserable? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives would like to have Canadians think that a temporary pause on taxes would actually benefit Canadians at the pumps. We know that that is simply not the case. We know that the oil companies would not pass those savings on to Canadians. On this side of the House, we're focused on real, long-term plans to address affordability, not cheap political gas gimmicks. The Honourable Member for Balfour's Lloyd Minster. Mr. Speaker, clearly this government doesn't care if it makes lives miserable for Canadians. The pocketbooks of Canadians cannot keep up with skyrocketing costs. Just last week, we know that the Bank of Canada revealed that the carbon tax alone increased inflation by 0.4%, wow. confirming that this Liberal policy is hurting Canadians. It's a failed policy that is even more costly for those living in rural communities, and it is set to increase. Mr. Speaker, if the NDP Liberal government won't abandon the carbon tax, will they at least provide Canadians some immediate relief with a GST holiday on gasoline and diesel? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, our plan is designed so that the majority of households receives more in climate action incentive payments than they pay. This has been confirmed by the independent analysis of the Parliamentary Budget Officer. As the carbon tax increases, these payments also increase, leaving the majority of Canadians with more money in their pockets. In Ontario, households will receive $600 this year, Mr. Speaker, $720 in Manitoba, $1,000 in Saskatchewan, and $980 in Alberta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hold on. We're, we're just, I'm just waiting for a sec here. Hold on. Stand up. There we go. Uh, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister, who did not know the price of Baksha bacon, is probably surprised to hear inflation is at 5.7 percent and rising. His carbon tax has generated surplus revenue, taking money out of the pockets of average Canadians. When will the NDP Liberal government give some of that back? to the Canadian who work hard and pay it. The Honourable Minister. Let me talk about some facts about affordability that this side of the aisle is putting into place. Fact, a single mom with two kids will receive 13600 from the Canada Child Benefit. Fact, the average family in Saskatchewan will get almost $1,000 in their carbon price rebate. Fact, Seniors received an extra 500 this summer. Fact, a student will save $3,000 through our change to student loans. Real facts on affordability, not political gimmicks. The Honourable Member for Battle River, Crowfoot. Hey. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Governor of the Bank of Canada revealed that the carbon tax contributed to inflation by nearly half a percent. While well, the Liberals claim that this isn't their fault and that it is a global phenomenon, those who think and understand monetary policy know otherwise. This is costing Canadians who I hear from who are paying more for their home heating and more at the pumps. So my question is this. Will the NDP Liberal government commit today to scrapping their carbon tax increase to come into effect on April 4th? Hey, hey. The 
The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that a price on pollution is the best way to fight climate change, and that inflation is a global phenomenon. The data the member opposite is citing is from the governor does not factor in the rebates that are putting more money in the pockets of Canadians now with quarterly payments. And while it's not surprising to see Conservatives campaigning for less climate action against the climate action incentive, which put more money in the pockets of eight out of ten Canadian families, it's still disappointing. While they decide on climate change, we're going to fight climate change. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. This government said supporting women fleeing violence is their top priority. Gender-based violence has been rising at an alarming rate, and in my city of London, it has increased by 53 per cent. But organizations like Innova in London that support women are being told that they will not get the necessary funding to run their life-saving programs. Without action, women in Canada will continue to experience devastating violence. In the upcoming budget, this government must provide core, stable funding. When will the Liberals keep their promise and stand up for women? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the Honourable Member's question and would like to let her know that we on this side of the House have been standing up for women. When COVID-19 hit, we were there. A hundred million dollars, Mr. Speaker, in shelter funding that helped 1,200 organizations. We knew when the pandemic hit that home wasn't safe for everyone, and we made sure that we provided the funding to help women and will continue to do so. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, 34% of people who menstruate had to sacrifice other needs to afford menstrual hygiene products. It costs an individual an average of $6,000 over a lifetime for these products. Menstrual hygiene products are essential health necessities, not luxuries, yet this government makes us beg for a pad. When will the Liberal government acknowledge the reality of period poverty in this country and ensure equitable access to free menstrual hygiene products for all. Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Thank you so much, the Honourable Member, for her question and for her advocacy. It's good to work with her. I will say this, we are working, my team and I, on that. It is part of my mandate letter. We take it very, very seriously. We are also consulting with organizations on the ground, Mr. Speaker, that will inform us on the path ahead. The Honourable Member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Mr. Speaker, yesterday was the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. This day reminds us that while progress is being made to fight systemic racism, hate and injustice, there's much more work to do. And that work is really important because uplifting vulnerable communities improves the health and prosperity of all Canadians, including our economy. Can the Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion please tell us what our government is doing to combat racism so that communities like mine in Mississauga, Erin Mills, can continue to flourish and prosper? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for her question on her important advocacy on an important matter. Our government has taken the issue of tackling racism as a, as a top priority. That is why we've invested over $100 million uh, in the anti-racism strategy, including investing uh, $70 million in community organizations fighting racism on the ground. But we know that there is more work to be done. That is why we're committed to fighting uh, systemic racism in our institutions. We're committed to renewing our anti-racism strategy and supporting racialized Canadians every step of the way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hello, I have the deputy to Charles Beau. The Honourable Member for Charles Beau, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, Yesterday, I posed a question to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but instead I heard back from the Parliamentary Secretary, who was just reading off a sheet and it had nothing to do with my question. So I will ask it again. This is important. The Liberals finally seem to understand that it's important to send lethal weaponry to Ukraine. And in an interview, the Minister of Foreign Affairs said that the weapons have reached Ukrainian territory. So my question is simple. Are all the weapons sent by Canada now on the Ukrainian battlefield, yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am working closely with my colleague, the Minister of Defence, of course, on this issue. We are coordinated. Of course, we know that Ukraine must be able to defend itself against the Russian aggressor. As my colleagues know, we are providing weapons and equipment to Ukraine. 
That is important to enable people to defend themselves on the ground. It is also important diplomatically because it means that it puts them into a good position to negotiate around the table. The Honorable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we see that the answer to Mario Dumont ye uh, yesterday was false because we can see that the weapons are not in Ukraine. And we know that recently the Prime Minister and some ministers visited Europe and ran around Europe a bit. No one knows why, apart from some photo ops. The Prime Minister will be going to a G7 meeting. Will he be bringing the NDP leader with him to ensure that the NDP leader can tell him to not get so involved in Ukraine? Look at the Minister. The Honourable Minister. First of all, my colleague should be reassured that Ukrainians are supported by Canada. I know that's something that my colleague has been asking for, and the entire House of Commons is united on this point, first of all. Secondly, Canadians expect lethal and non-lethal assistance to arrive in Ukraine, but Canadians and our allies and our allies know that we cannot divulge details of this. It's a security question. I will continue to work closely with my colleague on this issue. And he can rest assured that when our government makes statements, they are true. Herbert Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, I and many other combat veterans were disappointed to hear the Minister of Foreign Affairs state Canada, quote, is not a military power, unquote. I have led some of, some of Canada's finest warriors in Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Iraq. I'd like to educate the minister. The Canadian success in, quote, making sure that diplomacy is happening, unquote, during global con conflicts is predicated by our ability to back it up militarily. Perfect. Mr. Speaker, I'm doubtful the minister will apologize, but will she acknowledge the Canadian Armed Forces personnel are amongst the best in the world and that Canada is a military power? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Obviously, we support our men and women in uniform. That's exactly why I had the chance to go to Ukraine to meet with them through Operation Unifier and as well as in Latvia. At the same time, I find it a bit rich coming from the Conservatives as they reduce their military spending below 1% of GDP. Minister. Of course, as I mentioned, I find it a bit rich on the part of the Conservative as they reduce their military spending where they were in government below 1%, which was the lowest in 60 years. Of course, it will be a pleasure to work with my colleague because the question of Ukraine is not a partisan question. It is a question that should unite ourselves while people are... The Honourable Member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, Ukrainians are fighting for their freedom, democracy, and even their lives. They've asked for more help from Canada. The Canadian Armed Forces is in the process of divesting many armored vehicle fleets like the Coyote, M113, and Bison armored vehicles as they are replaced by the Armored Combat Support Vehicle Project. Could these vehicles be donated to Ukraine? And if so, when? Good question. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question and the Canadian Armed Forces for their ongoing and historic work to protect our country and contribute to our world. I would like to say, I would like to say in addition to that, that we have contributed lethal and non-lethal aid to Ukraine, anti-tank missiles, grenades, including fragmentation vests, and we will continue to provide millions and millions worth of aid to Ukraine. In terms of the suggestion going forward, I look forward to working with my honourable colleague to get more details on his suggestions so that we can take it forward. We will continue to, to leave no stone unturned to assist Ukraine. Thank you. The honourable member for Lac Saint Jean, Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois supports some of this government's measures to make it easier to welcome refugees from the Ukraine war. But once the minister has invited these families. It is not appropriate to let them languish in refugee camps for weeks or even months. They are going through a traumatizing situation. They need help. They need to hear the government of Canada tell them that flights are on the way. And they need to know when. 
So, when will the minister charter flights and create an airlift? I'd like to thank the member for his question, and I'd like to thank him for his collaborative attitude on the issue of Ukraine. It is possible for all parties to collaborate with our government. We are prioritizing Ukrainian applications. More than 10,000 Ukrainians have arrived in Canada since January. Last week, I announced new measures that will enable Ukrainians to come to Canada more easily and quickly, as well as safely. I will continue to work with my colleagues to enable a large number of Ukrainians to arrive in Canada. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, the Minister knows he can count on our cooperation, but things need to move. People don't understand how it is that there is still no air operation with chartered flights to bring refugees here. Even Air Transat is ready to participate. It has said it is ready if the government was willing to organize this type of operation. So if even these air companies are willing, well then, can the minister announce today that this operation will occur? Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We will work closely with our partners, including provinces and territories, the private sector and resettlement agencies, as well as the Ukrainian community in Canada to resettle people arriving from Ukraine. I am working closely with the private sector, and I recently met with stakeholders just before QP. I will continue my work to facilitate the arrival of the greatest possible number of Ukrainians to Canada. We're treating it as such, and we're going to continue to work to welcome as many people here as quickly as possible, as safely as possible. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rita Lakes. Yesterday, the Health Minister told committee that the government had a plan for every possible policy related to their continued mandates, but he repeatedly refused to share the government's plan to end the mandates, and I want to give him another chance right now. The provinces have shown leadership and are all moving on from COVID mandates. Will the minister tell Canadians on which date the Liberal NDP government will end the COVID mandates. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his uh, collaboration on the Health Committee. Today we know more about COVID-19 than ever before, and we're in a very different place than we, we were in March 2020. We have safe, effective vaccines and highly fa vaccinated population, as well as uh, testing, surveillance tools, and, and new ways to identify variants of concern and track the spread of the virus. But the future remains certain, and COVID-19 is not over. There are many, many factors at play, and our government is committed to following the science going forward to get out of this pandemic for good. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rita Lakes. And if the parliamentary secretary says the government is going to follow the science, then he should do that, just like the 10 chief medical officers of health have done in every single province in this country. They're all ending the mandate. So we want to know what the benchmarks are. What are the data points that this government is going to use to end the mandate? So they don't need to end the mandates uh, today if they have a plan. But the problem is they don't have a plan. They're putting politics first. They're dividing Canadians, dividing communities. So when will they put politics aside and the division? look to the science, follow the leadership of the provinces, their chief medical officers of health, and end the federal here, here, mandates. Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank my colleague across the way for acknowledging that my answer was both thorough and good. I, I also want to acknowledge that he asked some pretty good questions yesterday on committee, and I thought the answers that the minister gave him were excellent. There, this is a very complex issue. This is a very, very complex issue. And our government is going to keep making decisions based on the best science. And we also understand that there are two jurisdictions. There are provincial jurisdictions and there are federal ones. The provinces will make decisions accordingly with their health officials. And we will make our decisions based on the science, uh, the exact same science, with our health officials. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Well, they might be based on political science, but certainly not medical science. Yesterday, when the health minister was asked to explain when federal mandates would be taken off. He shrugged his shoulders and he said, well, COVID is still here. 
no benchmarks have been set, no plan has been put in place, and no assurances have been given as to when we return to normal. This is absolutely irresponsible of the government. Provinces can do it, other countries can do it, why can't Canada do it? So when will the Prime Minister follow the science, the real science, lift the mandates and give Canadians their freedom back? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to address the question from my colleague and the entire Conservative caucus that is unmasked today and is pretending that COVID-19 is completely over. I'm sorry, we can't wish the pandemic is over. We have to follow the science, and our government is committed to following that science. A certain level. I'm just waiting for a certain level and then we'll keep going. There, the parliamentary secretary. Put your mask on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will put my mask on as soon as I sit back down, like the rest of my colleagues who are committed to following the science. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This pandemic is not over. Canadians. Can we just. Can we just. Can we just wait until after question period is done, we can go out and run around or do something? <laughs> All right. I am going to give the member uh, an opportunity to respond. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I want this pandemic to be over as soon as possible, just like every other member of this House. I've continued to follow the science, my colleagues have continued to follow the science, and we will ensure that we get through this pandemic. But the thing that I can't get over is the fact that Canadians are in the hospital right now. Over 5,000 Canadians are in the hospital right now with COVID-19, and you don't seem to care. Our colleagues across don't seem to care. Ten questions left, so <laughs> all right, we ready? All right. The Honourable Member, the Honour of the Deputy de Saint Leonard, Saint Michel. The Honourable Member for Saint Leonard, Saint Michel. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last Friday, the government of Quebec, the city of Montreal, and the government of Canada announced a new version and reconfiguration of the project to extend the Montreal Metro Blue Line. This is a project that is highly anticipated by the entire metropolitan community and has been awaited for several decades. Can the Honourable Minister for Canadian Heritage tell this House about how the federal government is concretely supporting Quebecers with this initiative? The Honourable, the Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage, thank you very much. I'd like to thank my colleague for her excellent question. This is a solid question. We are investing $1.3 billion to contribute to this project. This is a project that is important for her because it goes through writing and it also comes to my writing. We've been waiting for this for 50 years. More than 25,000 Quebecers, additional Quebecers, will be able to access an effective and reliable transit network. And that's in addition to the $750 million that we announced for transit networks throughout the country. This is a priority for our government, and we will continue to support it. Honourable Member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Canada is a signatory to the conventions of the International Labour Organization, which prohibit international commerce in prison-made goods unless the prisoners are paid market wages. This leaves me wondering how Corrections Canada justifies its plan to open a factory farm at Joyceville Penitentiary where prisoners would milk 2,200 goats to produce infant formula for export to China while being paid only a fraction of the minimum wage. Doesn't this plan violate our international commitments? Here. Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, prison farm at uh, Collins Bay, I know what a tremendous organization uh, it's happening there. I will check into that matter for the Honourable Member and I will respond back to him. The Honourable Member for Moose Jaw, Lake Centre, Lanigan. Mr. Speaker, 
Farmers are paying record amounts to dry grain. Families are paying record amounts to fill their vehicles to get their kids to school and get groceries. The price of gas in my riding is at over $1.78. On April 1st, this coalition is once again raising the carbon tax. People in my riding don't find this April Fool's prank funny. Policy should be there to help us, not punish us. Here, here. Saskatchewan families need help with the rising cost of living, not another tax hike. When will this NDP Liberal government cancel this tax grab? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all know that carbon price is one of the most effective measures to reduce emissions, and if they won't believe the parliamentary budget officer, if they won't believe the IMF, maybe they will believe the member from New Brunswick Southwest, who said that his province should go back to using the federal carbon pricing system, because at least it comes with rebate, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you. The Honourable Member for Costa Bays Central, Notre Dame. Mr. Speaker, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and industry stakeholders have waited a long time in anxious anticipation for decision on the Beta Nord Energy Project. Now with the NDP Liberal marriage, they're more uneasy than ever. Mr. Speaker, as the Prime Minister promised concessions such as cancelling energy projects like Beta Nord, in return for the, for the NDP hand in marriage. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of the decision on Equinor's project, Bajana Development. As the member opposite knows, it requires that we review the extensive information prior to deciding whether the Bajana project is... Order. Are we ready? Honestly, we can be here till 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and, and then we're done. Then, you know... So... There was a question. I want to hear the answer. Let's see if the minister can provide us with that answer. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, as I was saying, we, ha we need to have the look at extensive information prior to deciding whether the Bajanal project is likely to cause negative environmental effects. This is why we extended the legislated timeline for the project to provide with more time to review the considerable amount of complex information and make an informed decision. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for King's Hands. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know how important rail service is to be able to move essential goods across the country, whether or not it's inputs for farmers and ranchers or being able to actually take the bountiful harvest of those ranchers and producers and get it to export market. We watched with concern with the ongoing situation with CP Rail and the union in terms of what a disruption could mean to Canadians. That's right. I had the conversation to speak with the Minister of Labour directly in the last few days. I know he was on the ground in Calgary. We were working with federal mediators to be able to find a solution and thankfully that came this morning. Can this minister provide us an update on when services will resume and the work that was undertaken to get to this critical juncture? Here, Thank here, you. Here, here. Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, we have always respected the collective bargaining process because the best, most durable deals are made at the table. It is the best path to achieve fairness and stability in the economy. I want to congratulate and thank CP Rail and Teamsters. They stayed at the table and they put in the hard work to come to a resolution. Normal business operations will resume today and they will continue during the arbitration period. And I especially want to thank the good people at the Federal Mediation Service who worked so closely with the parties and supported them throughout these negotiations. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Mr. Speaker, the Arctic Poles are experiencing unprecedented heat waves, causing alarm among climate scientists. This is another dire warning that we are in a climate emergency. Yet the Liberals keep fueling the climate crisis, handing out billions to big oil and gas. The same companies that are making record profits as they gouge Canadians at the pump. How many more dire warnings does this government need before they stop paying big oil to pollute? When will this Prime Minister stop putting corporate profits before people and the planet? The Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for Victoria for her question. 
as we have committed to reduce, to, to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies two years earlier than our G20 country partners, Mr. Speaker, we will do this, and I will be happy to work with her to make that happen as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Welcome. The Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenay. The government is failing to help tourism businesses hardest hit by the pandemic. The Tourism and Hospitality Recovery Program was supposed to help, but due to an inflexible application process, many seasonal businesses can't access it. The Liberals cut its funding last week and the program will end in May, just when it's needed most. Will the government commit to continued full funding for the program? change the application requirements so seasonal operators are not excluded and extend the program until September. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Critic for his question. And as the Honourable Critic knows, we invested $15 billion in the tourism and hardest hit sector. In December, we passed C2, which put $12 billion of additional money into the tourism and hardest hit sector. Mr. Speaker, that includes half a billion dollars for the tourism relief fund. Announcements that are happening from coast to coast to coast in all kinds of ridings. My number one message to all of the tourism operators and all of the businesses is thank you. You are there with the borders open. Open, brighter days are ahead. We supported you during COVID. We'll support you now as well. Well, that's all the time we have for question period.